that was a blessing in disguise for me because I perhaps I'm the only cousin among my family who has lived with almost every auntie and I've lived in almost every small town in this country, in almost every village. And because of this experience, because my dad couldn't look after me alone, I was able to move around. Mm. I formed great relationships with all my around the family. I was able to build community in so many places. In fact, there's an anecdote a couple of days ago that I grew up in, uh, you know, in, in Pig Farm. Mm. Then somebody called one of my cousins and said, they saw me on the news. It's like, is that that little boy who used to go to the nursery school around here? Wow. I said, yeah, that's him, you know? Wow. So, yeah, so, I mean, it was a, it was a struggling family. I mean, it was, you know, there was no, there was no luxury. I wasn't born with a silver spoon mm. in my mouth. Mm. In, in fact, a couple of days ago, two days ago, I was in, in Akuse, America, to do some donation to the primary school there. Wow. And I took some people along because I wanted to see them to see where I've come from. It's, mm. a, it's a very modest upbringing. Interesting. And that a lot of us are, are left behind by this republic. Mm. You know? How many children were in the family? So my, my dad family has five children. Okay. Um, you know, and, and then beside that, you know how poor families do. You mm. raise other siblings and they also raise your children from time to time. So I always had a full house, almost, you know, uh, seven to 12 at a time. Did your mother have five children too? No, so my so my 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 mother had you know one daughter okay. and then myself and then my step siblings oh, as well. Okay, you know, all right. Um, so so two from your father. Yes. No, no. Well, my dad had all of, well had four and my mom had. My I'm, dad had. Yes. I'm, I mean, two from your father and mother. So yeah, so two from my father and mother. Right. I mean, even though I mean I consider both my stepmothers as, mm. as my mom as well. Mm. I'm blessed to have two two of everything. Two two stepmothers. Finally, the very last one before I jump into more serious things. Do yeah. you know why your father and mother separated? So uh, it's a very interesting one. I've been it's a story I have followed mm. um from f f uh, in, in trying to get into the genesis of it. Mm. Uh what I've come out of is that my my dad was a difficult man. Wow. <laughs> wow. You know, and and I I, mean, I even reflect about the fact that you know as a young kid that my father get to keep me instead of my mother. Mm. And it's, it's it speaks to the to the individual that he was. Right. And again, I mean those were times where you know we are not Patri patriarchy, mm. uh, even though we are challenging these norms now, mm. that the man could st stamp his feet on the ground and say, I'm keeping my son, and mm. he did. Mm. Right? Today, now, my mother did not have the means to challenge my dad in court, you know? So, I mean, I think now we are evolving a bit more, but I do think that a lot of it is down to, to the difficulty that the man was. What kind of spirituality were you raised in? Christianity, Islam, so, Buddhism? So, I, I mean, I, 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 my, I, my dad was, a, well, says a Catholic, I've never seen him go to church formally, but I've always saw him wake up at 3 a.m. and read his Bible with candles wow. and pray. Mm. And that's what I saw around around me most of the time. Uh, my stepmother as well, who played a role in raising me, was also with the Church of Christ. So it was a Christian, I would say, upbringing. Mm. Uh, mm. But it wasn't one that was restful. Mm. Uh, I was always searching. Mm. You know, uh, I remember by seven years old, I stopped refused to go to church with them wow. and I started attending with the Jehovah Witnesses for a while oh. then left there mm. and then I was I mean eventually in Morocco I went to the mosque a couple of times wow. so there was always this search for for meaning mm. beyond the formal religion mm. that would give some sense of spirituality to myself and being oh so you're a Muslim at the time I mean I, 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 I went to the mosque okay. I wouldn't identify All as a Muslim right. mm. but also in getting to understand Islam and what drove mm. Islam as well right oh. but it's always been a, a search for, for deeper connection with with why are we here? What, what, what did you find in Islam? You know, I, I think one of the things I've always appreciated Islam for mm. is the sense of community. Mm. And I think that they are very big on community and empathy towards others outside of the religion. Mm. And I think that's a very big quality to me. Naturally, like Christianity, they're both Abrahamic faiths. And so they suffer the defect of wanting to convert, convert the world to them right. and not being comfortable with people not sharing the faith. Right. You know, that's why in a lot of Islamic countries now, questions around atheism and all of that is dealt with a bit more with difficulty. But I think that at the root of it is a religion that is empathetic, mm -hmm. that creates community and that the people there are, have genuine love for, for each other. And, I, and I'm, I was deeply struck by it. Why didn't you stay in it? You know, I mean, I think for me it's a journey. I think I, I ended up understanding that the love for humanity was a bigger drive. And so it wasn't about creating tribe with people, but an understanding that there was a bigger community of people and that if you lo choose to love individuals, mm. there was a lot more that would drive you. Mm. That you come out from narrow boxes of we Christians do this, we mm. Muslims do that. Mm. It's that dividing factor that made me, that I am embracing of all religion, 
that and and do not consider myself as being stuck with one. Oh, okay. You know, I, I remember I, I went to see with the the families from Ejira. Mm. Went to see the national chief imam, and and as somebody, I was in Morocco and I studied uh, Islamic law. I mean, mm. I did law in Morocco as mm. well, and I was talking to him about the ummah and uh, what it means and how as somebody that I have a deep understanding and appreciation mm -hmm. of those. Mm. So I have enormous respect for it, but I think I want to be loved and I want to be able to sh spread the messaging and the good out of religion beyond the narrow boxes of what religion presents to us interesting know? interesting now oliver we're going to get into more serious things now you are an activist yeah at what point did you decide that listen i want to come out and fight for yeah. this nation you know I, I i i think that i have always described myself as an accidental activist mm. i didn't set out to be one i was somebody who though coming from very humble beginning right always believed that things would be fairer mm. and that we would all have the opportunity that the young will grow they said tomorrow's generation today today's people would be able to get access to directing the future of tomorrow's generation everybody will have their fair share as long as they apply themselves things like that mm. and so the early part of my life was very individualistic in that you know it was about acquiring degrees going to the best schools and things like that but at some point in the search for meaning you have to understand that there are things that, that go beyond the individual right and beyond what i can the bag i can secure for myself mm -hmm. as an individual but also i think that the drive towards becoming a lawyer i came to understand that it was a mission beyond just making solving rich people's problems okay but using the law in the service of humanity all right now when first the country started i have been reflecting over these questions for a while in fact my journey towards this began at harvard and at harvard we're having conversations around the legacy of slavery at the school okay and that's when i formed the first protest movement mm. against the colo you know some of the founders of harvard law school were people who donated money on the back of slaves and this was a legacy the school had not confronted with mm. in fact the logo of harvard university was the, sl the family crest of this slave holding family wow and so we started uh this protest movement and i became interested in these deep ethical issues about what values do we represent what meaning do we send about how we place value on human lives and the community we build around ourselves? You know, so that's when I started in the protest movement and we came to believe in the, in the power of protest as a tool for social change. You know, so I got involved in Black Lives Matter while I was in the U.S. and things like that. These things connected me to a bigger ambition. And so while a lot of people were at Harvard uh, as a pathway towards maybe this is how you get bigger money, right. I discovered activism mm. while I was in that community, mm. you know. Mm. Mm. Did you succeed in getting this logo changed? Oh, yes. So, so yes, it, it, it failed. There was a committee uh, that was established. I was part of the committee which recommended for the logo to be removed, for scholarships to be established, for, for, for people from, you know, African diaspora, slave former slaves and generation of slaves, for them to be able to attend Harvard Law School, for curriculum to be changed so that there will be a recognition of the racial legacy, critical race theory to be introduced. These were broader things that we were able to fight and win for that is still today acknowledged formally by, by Harvard. So are you saying that the logo of Harvard stayed on for several years until you started to protest about it? Yes. And then it was changed? Yes. In fact, I remember my very first orientation at Harvard Law School. There was an author who had been brought to tell about the history of the school. Mm. And he kind of just made the comments in person. Like, oh yeah, this crest is the whole slaveholding family. And I was deeply sh struck by how blasé and like you know that it was all taken mm. so it wasn't a history that was hidden but nobody had confronted its meaning wow. what does it mean for wow. us to be represented by this logo mm. you know and so yes yeah, so that's when we started the activist movement which was royal mass four royal being the 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 family of of of, of this slaveholding family that donated to Harvard law school you know and and royal did fall and in fact when we started organizing this the name Royal Must Fall, for those who recognize, we've, we, we chose it in solidarity as well with Fees Must Fall in South Africa. At the time the South African Fees Must Fall protests mm -hmm, were happening, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. we first came out, and my first statement that I, I gave the first speech was first to acknowledge that students were fighting for educational justice in South Africa, but also we need to bring these conversations home and what the educational space represents for people and people of color in, 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 in a white institution like Harvard. Interesting. When specifically were you born? So I was born in, in uh, December 1986, you know. So fa fairly before the Second Republic came into came into being, uh, but but young young enough to see, and I suppose old enough at the same time to see this new project of the 1992 Republic come into shape. And I'm formed part of those generations that were raised 
we've believed in this republic that have now seemingly lost hope in the promises that he gave us as young people. Interesting. So you were born in 1986? Yes. Sir. You don't want to tell us specifically when? Oh, since, since December 1986. Six December. Wow. Yeah. 1986. Yeah. Interesting. Whoa. I can't believe this. <laughs> ah. You have achieved so much. Do you see yourself as an achiever? I mean, to be able to bring down a whole logo, be part of uh, not just any logo, but Harvard. You know, um, I, like I was saying, in the mm. beginning part of my life, it was really about individualism. Mm. That it was about, and that's what the context in which I was raised for, that you are, you see that we come from a modest family. Right. And it's your role to, to, uh, to bring money and lift the family up. Right. So that's how I saw myself. And so it was achievement driven. But I think now it's bigger than that. It's mm. about values. It's about what we build together as a society. It's about the people we bring together. And so I take very seriously my role as a mobilizer. And so the biggest achievement for me at Harvard Law School was about the people who were able to mobilize, the right. conscience we were able to raise and trick. And that there was nothing different from that same language and coming to Ghana and coming on and saying that, I don't want to do anything. I just want to protest. You know, that's how the country started. Mm. It just said that, you know what, the country is going bad and we just want to get onto the streets and say it. And through that language of mobilizing people for a protest, we've built community. Mm. We've built a sense of belief that young people have a stake in the future of the country. And that's the kind of thing that are moving me now. And I, I, I treasure very much. Interesting. Very interesting. Oliver Mawusi Baka Vomawa is my guest right here in the African History Class Friday edition. And we are talking. <laughs> Oliver, tell me, how did you find yourself at Harvard? So, um, when I, you know, I, I left Ghana when I was 16 right. for, for Morocco. So, I studied in Morocco. At the time, I was very interested in, you know, the Israeli-Arab conflict. What schools did you attend in Ghana? So, in, in Ghana, I was, I was, well, first I started, because my dad raised me very early mm. on, uh, I was sent to Gideon International School. Which was, well, first I did a boarding school at, before in kindergarten. I sent to Gideon International School in Odumase, Krobo. Left there for Krobo State College in, 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 at Kwong. Then left there to uh, Holy Family Catholic School, which was at uh, 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 Akuse. Mm. And then from there I went to Akwamuman Secondary School in, in Akosombo. And then, and then left the country uh, uh, at, at 16 for, for Morocco. So I did, I did bachelor's in Morocco. I went to learn French and studied Oh, so you speak I studied, French? Yes, I, I studied in... Uh, wow. I did law in, in French, mm -hmm. and then I did a master's in international law. Mm -hmm. And at the time, then I came back to Ghana um, and, and, and joined the Constitution Review Commission oh, uh, okay. and worked for the Constitution Commission as a, as a constitutional researcher Wow. before, before leaving for Harvard. Mm -hmm. mm. Wow, interesting. So you are a lawyer? I am, I am. Uh, <laughs> I, I mean, now I think that I, I... You know, a lot of the times I've talked about how I, I tried not to self-identify as a lawyer because I think what law means and the mission and the value of law, mm. it, it's not the same thing here. It's not viewed as a calling to, to enhance social justice. Mm. And a very few, if I ask for you to, to name five human rights lawyers in Ghana, you'll struggle. Everybody is, you know, interested in... The president practice. is one of those. I, I, I don't think mm. the president has human rights at his heart. Okay. I don't, I don't believe it, and I, I don't think so. I think that his whole career has always been, been politically strategic, mm. and that the causes he fought for have always been, you know, MPPA, IGP, things like that. He talked about the protest, and I think it's, it has some repercussions for the rights we're supposed to enjoy, but it's always been in advance of the political projects of the MPP. Right. And I think that it has to be beyond that. For you to, to 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 end that, you know, I think of a person like Martin Kwebu, for instance. Martin Kwebu, who is organizing the a demonstration on November fifth, he has lived his life truly in seeking the interest of the individual Ghanaian, mm. in fighting things around reforms around criminal justice, and it's impressive. I think of Francis Xavier Sosu, for instance, somebody who's lived his life in proving the lot of of the less fortunate. Right. People like that give me inspiration and, and, and I and there are very few in Ghana, unfortunately. And I do hope that you know we can raise a generation of people who are not only driven by by money and, and search for themselves but care for other people. Did you want to throw overthrow Nana Kufuado? Yes, yes. Okay. I, I think so. I think mm. I I've always wanted to over well, not him particularly, but mm. any regime I think that any regime that has lost the values of of the rule of law and of constitutionalism and uh, 
you know, abiding by democracy needs to go out. But in the process of overthrowing such regimes, we must also be careful that we do not lose the tenets and the values of democracy that drive us. All right. And I think that there's enough within our constitutional democracy that would allow us to get rid of an oppressive regime like Takufuado's regime mm. that we can use. So I believe in constitutionally overthrowing the gentleman. Oh, okay. You know, and I think that all regimes, and I think we have a duty to fight oppressive regimes. Mm. And his regime has become oppressive to Ghanaians. Mm. And that we must mobilize all that is democratic in this country mm. to overthrow the gentleman mm. legally mm. that by forcing him to resign or impeaching the gentleman. So when you said coup d'etat, did it uh, appear to you that this was a legal way of overthrowing the president? You know, so I've always used the word coup mm. uh, rather than a coup d'etat. Mm. And I use it because as a gentleman, as somebody who was trained uh, in French legal tradition, understanding that the word has 28 different meanings. Mm. In fact, from the very first time since the country started, the conversations around these people want to do a coup d'etat mm. was being championed by government appointees. Mm. In fact, the Minister of Interior was in Parliament claiming that we were being hijacked by terrorists. Wow. So it became useful for me then to co-opt the language of coup. Mm and use it in a democratic conversation mm. and to tell you that yes what we are doing is we're doing a coup mm. it's a coup of mindset mm. it's a coup of our family nyame attitude mm. it's a coup of letting people who we have elected uh treat us as they treat us so we must change it's calling for the young citizens to speak up and change the way in which they engage with the population but not to take up arms mm. and, and 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 shoot the individual or do any of those things. I think that I mean I am a person. I'm a pacifist by nature. Mm. You know, I in fact I do not so, so much. I don't believe in guns that right. I think it is ethically wrong mm. for the police to come to civic demonstrations clad with AK-47 around us. In fact, the reality of this democracy is that every even directing traffic, the police are holding guns around us. It's offensive to what the democracy should represent. That is what a police state looks like. So I believe in the power of mobilizing people and using our voices. In fact, one of the things I was, the first time I was accused, I was reported to the police uh, and, and for that I wanted to overthrow the Republic was at the very first demonstration when I said, with our voices, we would overthrow the 1992, the, the Fourth Republic, which is not serving us. Meaning that with our voices, we can reform the Fourth Republic. So I've believed in the power of the voice and the, the power, the mobilizing effect of language rather than the gun. When you wanted to go for the botched um, uh, demonstration uh, and you wanted guns and other weapons to be sent to the place, did you think about the police state? So this is the, the conversation we had. Mm. One of the things in which you are in a republic which refuses to, to respect the lives of unarmed protesters mm. is that we must be bolder in our confrontation of the state. And so we say to the police, you have a simple responsibility, which is to protect civilians when they come out to demonstrate. Not to kill them, mm. but consistently you've been killing demonstrators. Mm. If you consider that you are unable to protect demonstrators, right. then allow them to protect themselves. Mm. Now we did this to be provocative. For us to reflect together as a society, should guns, whether heard by the police or anybody, have a place at a demonstration? I believe not. And so it is a question of then putting, reversing the role. You're looking at these people who are holding guns and killing civilians. What if you got to a stage where people, civilians, were then arming themselves for fear that they were going to die at the hands of the police that would protect them? Mm -hmm. This is the critical and rude conversation we wanted to have with the people of Ghana. Did you mean it? Did you want people to literally go to the demonstration? Absolutely with not. I mean, absolutely not. In fact, the conversation with the police, we never even talked about it publicly with anybody. Nobody, I mean, it's the police that came to have that conversation. Uh, outside, we came to say that publicly. And because this was a conversation about the way in which the police continue to use guns and the ways in which they are, they are easily killing people without repercussions, we wanted them to be confronted with that conversation. Did it wasn't write, about mobilizing people did, to did hold guns. Did you write an official letter to the police to that? Um... No, in fact, we didn't. You know, there wasn't an official letter given to them. There was a, there was a letter we were working on and one gentleman sent it to the police over WhatsApp. And then the police said, this is not a formal way to notify us of a demonstration, so bring a formal letter to us the next day, which we didn't. We knew when we, it wasn't a demonstration of such we were planning, right? But we wanted to have that conversation around, the, uh, around guns. Mm. So we didn't follow up with sending them a formal notice. You know? And then when we scheduled a press conference um, on police brutality, in that morning, they went ahead and released 
that mm. that thing as if we had formally engaged them mm. regarding this right but it, we believe it was an attempt to kind of divert the conversation around questions around police brutality and the lack of accountability for it you know and on that day we had brought all victims of police brutality from across the country who came to tell their painful stories right, right. you know but it's fine i mean i think that in this game where the police have become much more interested in protecting the regime and about regime survival that about how they can improve policing and that again respect as a service to the people it's not surprising to me that those questions it was brought in to muddy the waters and in a way in fact they succeeded in diverting attention i think they did yeah my guess is oliver mawusi baka from our we are talking we are still talking <laughs> Well, I mean, some other conveners of the fix the country decided to pull out, albeit temporarily. Uh, somebody like Uketechie was not happy with the fact that, well, there was a certain communique that went out to the police and people had to bring guns, were asked to bring guns, including EFF boss. You know, have you been able to sort this out? You know, I think that one of the, um, perhaps one of the biggest things that ultimately was unfortunate in, in, in everything was that, you know, um, I do think conversations around how we deal with certain blowbacks to the way in which we choose to do our advocacy and the ways in which we, we, deal, with, we deal with problems when they do arise in, a, in trying to build a people's movement. Those are some of the things that we didn't do quite well, mm. you know, in being able to manage these things and, and then come out stronger. I am encouraged by the fact that these individuals, um, you know, we're sitting down when we are having conversations. Oh, you're having conversations. And that we are, we are mm. discussing the way forward because I think we are all animated by one spirit. Mm. The how do we deliver a response to a regime that is impoverishing Ghanaians? Mm. How do we, you know, create a better future for our people in this role as to motivate other people to join the fight. And I do think that it's a struggle that it's a perennial, it's a forever struggle right. that we would leave the stage and young people and other people would come and take our place. Mm. And so that we must be able to prepare it in a way that other people will then come up and take up the charge, right. even when we are not there. Mm. And I think that because we are all animated by this spirit, we are finding ways back into conversations mm. and dealing with what are some of the things we didn't do right? What are some of the ways in which we correct our mistakes going forward? Enable to be able to deliver on the mandates that people continue to trust upon us, mm. whether we ask for it or not, that we have to lead a certain resistance towards the the, the kind of two-party system that the, the Fourth Republic has delivered to us. When you go on demonstrations, I know that you have to pay for people to drink free water, to pay for people to sweep the streets and all that. Who funds you? So one of the things we, we started from the very beginning was that we have to be very careful that we do not become co-opted by the two forces of this democracy, the MPP and the NDC. And it's the, your, your independence starts to inch away if you were to go cap in hand begging for money from these people. Mm. Once you do that, you lose your credibility, you lose your independence. Right. And so what we did from the very beginning was that we were going to throw the challenge to people, ordinary people of Ghana, that this is our thing. The Italians say Cosa Nostra. This is our thing. And so that if we wanted to succeed, we must fund it ourselves. We do not have the, the level of organization and the financial resources and muscles of political parties. But at least there's a moral rightness in that people are sending their one city, two city to mobile money and helping us to be able to fund and raise this thing. That's the way in which we've proceeded. Now the very fun, non-funding that we have received has not come from Ghan Ghanaian people directly was a, a grant we've received from Open Society Foundation for $50,000 to do community activism and mobilizing and educating people mm. and mobilizing people towards mm. our call for a new constitution. You know, this is the only time we've received funding from an independent tour. Mm. But a lot of the money that we have received has come from people sending their one city, two city to us on mobile money. You are not founded by any political party. Never been founded by any political party. And I think that we will continue to to, to operate in a way in which we do not receive funding from either the MPP or the NDC. Oliver, do you have two wives? <laughs> I wish. This is one of the things I wish I did. I know that, you know, when I was arrested, mm -hmm. uh, an attorney general who uh, was so failing on the law that they, they resorted to drama and, and reality TV antics 
uh, release information to the public claiming that I have two wives and I was my wives were confusing the public. Mm. I think it's a shame. Really. Mm. I think I think the office of the Attorney General is a high office of the Republic, and that this is antics that are beneath that office. You know that they were engaging. But yeah, no, I I, I don't have two wives, and maybe hopefully. I, I get there, but not at this time, no. Wow. So, who were these two women confusing the public? I, I mean, and, and this is one of the this is one of the strangest things. Before I flew down to the country, um, I knew I was going to be arrested. Mm. But I said that whatever it is, we will do it for the public good to be able to show them the real face of the regime we are facing. And so, when I I mean I was transiting through Portugal at the airport, I sat down, was on call with my lawyers, anticipating what could happen. And so when I arrived in the country, I mean, I'm a lawyer myself. Mm -hmm. I, just, I was communicating with the police, we were asking him questions like, we know that you have a British passport. Where is it? Bring it. You have, I'm like, I mean, I just kept mum, you know, and kept quiet. And in the initial stages when I was picked up by members of the armed forces, my refusal to talk was one of the reasons why they, they tortured me severely. For, for hours, for five hours, I was being tortured. By How did they take you out from the system. plane? Were you the first person to be removed? No, or you in came fact. Last? So when I came, I came mm. out of the airport, mm. uh, came, walked to the, to the immigration, and then I, I handed over my passport. And then, you know, he called over, the officer then called over another person, and I asked, what is the problem? He says, oh, our system is down. And then I just started laughing. And so then I picked up my phone that I was to call my lawyers that is happening. Right when I tried to do that is when they kind of bundled me up. No, you can't make a call, and then pushed me uh, to another area of the airport. Immigration, immigration, mm. and then held me there. I kept asking them, "Am I under arrest?" They said no. When I made an attempt to leave, they wrestled me, and then plain clothes officers. Then they ushered me into a room where plain clothes officers then came in and then started butcher. I mean, started torturing me, booting me here and they spitting on me, saying that foolish ever man. And uh, oh, really? Uh, wow. Who, uh, something about you being an insect. As, it was a very uh, ethnically charged. What language were they speaking? They're speaking tree. Wow. You know, and 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 really more treating me in that room. They were kicking you. Oh, kick! You were kicking me, spitting, spitting on, on me. Wow. One used their their knee on my on my neck. It was just it was, it was just really really horrid. Were and then after that, they took me out of that that, mm. uh, that place, sent me into a different part of the airport where this continued for nearly five hours. In wow. fact, I was arrested around 5 p.m. and was taken to a Sherman police station around 11 p.m. And this time, as I said, I had had conversations with my lawyers. So they had come to the airport. Some of them were at the airport police station and some of them were at the airport trying to see like whether I would be allowed out and what was going to happen. And for those hours, they had no information what was happening. Right? My family was there as well. And eventually, they ended up releasing a statement that I was missing. At the time, I had been taken to, to a Sherman police station. I was being held there. It wasn't until like 4 a.m. before the police released a statement saying that I wasn't missing and that, in fact, they had arrested me and that I was being kept at Tema, which was also not true, you know. Um, yeah, so that's kind of... How did know. they take you to that Sherman police station? So, after, I mean, all these incidents happened, they took me out of the, the where I was being held and then put a, an, uh, a hood over my head oh, really? and pushed me into a, 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 a V8, mm. I think. There was one military officer by my side, another by my side, both fully armed with guns. Do you know if it was air-conditioned? Uh, the vehicle, it was, because the windows were up, mm. um, you know, while we're riding. In fact, I had to guess to myself, because one of the things they were saying to me was that we can, you know, we can kill you and nobody would even find out. Mm. And so in the moment when they were taking me out and the fact that I was being covered in a hood, Actually, you know, your mind goes back to some of those days, Bundasi and all those places, like, what is going to happen? You know? And so, first, I could tell we're in Accra traffic because of how the car was moving. Mm. And then by then, when it started speeding, I had an instinct that we were on the motorway. Mm. You know, so I could only guess just by contextual information of how the car was moving as to whether we were leaving Accra or this thing. Did they speak whilst you were being carried away? So, I was asked, I continued to ask them, why am I being arrested and why are you holding me? And then they continue to deliver slaps and continue to assault me. Did you use abusive but I, words? Did I, you I couldn't back? even in that circumstance. Mm. You know, like the 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 amount of torture I had been I had received for five hours. Mm. I was emotionally weak, but I needed to have the presence of mind that at every point I continued to ask them why I was being arrested, why I was being held, and why these things were being meted to me. Did they offer you food? Not at any point. In fact, at some point, I when I thought that they were taking me to go and kill me. I, I asked that they drop... I wanted to pee mm. so that they would stop 
somewhere on the motorway and I could make a run for it. I was thinking in my mind. Wow. And when I said that, they said you can pee your shit on yourself. My Excuse God. my language. My God. You know, so I understood the so I was actually very surprised that where they took me was was a police station. Mm. You know, and, and, and then we stopped somewhere, the lights were on and eventually when the hood was removed, it took me a while because the the, the lights, the blue and red lights were all over. This is three FM to, to kind of understand that we are at a police station. Interesting, you know. Oliver Mawusi Baka Vomawa is my guest. We are talking. We are still talking. And this is three FM ninety two point seven. This is the African History Class. All right. So when you got to the police station, what happened there? Did they just push you in? So when I went to the police station, that's when they started also about uh, wanting personal detail from me. Uh, what's your address? Uh, you know, we understand you have a British passport. Where is it? We understand this. And all the while, it dawned on me how very little our security establishment knows about me, me. And, and it's not something that was accidental it's something that had been intentional in making sure that they knew very little about my personal life mm, mm. and it wasn't information that I was going to volunteer to them and in fact I didn't still you didn't volunteer any information interesting to them. and oh. then so it surprised me that they claimed that two yeah. wives from one in UK and one in Gashama I'm like yeah <laughs> had come to the police absolutely are you a polygamist do you Want you know, I, I, I think that one of the things I've said that um, consent is, is very important in every yeah, relationship. Is, yeah. And I, I think that it is not the place of the state to audit the sexual lives of citizens. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's not his role. Mm -hmm. It shouldn't play that role. Mm -hmm. I think that as long as people are consenting to the nature of the relationship, then it's important. I believe in ethical non-monogamy, mm. meaning that you don't cheat on the person, which is the way of life of most Ghanaians, but that you disclose to the person that I don't uh, I want to. I, I. I'm. Not, I'm not monogamous, and I. You need to know this before me before we come into me. Oh, interesting. You understand? So I like that. So truth is a very important tool. Mm. Unfortunately, it is. It's normal in this country to get married and then be having side chicks and lying. And this you know, is you know, three FM. In comic, but I think that consensualism is important. Wow. If I think about the role of the state, is that in situations like this, the state has to be much more protective of children who come out of this situations how to be watchful about domestic abuse in these situations and things like that not to determine you know whether or not you can sleep with one individual or two I don't only think if i mistake. understand what you're telling me uh you have spoken with your wife and told your wife that you are an african and for that matter you cannot sleep with one woman you want to have another woman right <laughs> no completely not okay. you're changing what i'm saying mm. i'm saying as a matter of public policy mm. it is not the business of the state okay to audit the ways in which people have wives or not okay like we have a very strange arrangement in fact this matter has been challenged in the supreme court now oh, wow i like that. where we have some people mm -hmm. if you decide to marry under the mohammedan act yes you can marry four yes uh, or more if you marry under the you know marriage act then you have can do one if you go under customary you can do as many it, it, it has a, i don't understand this regime i think that the most important thing has always been based on consent right and that in fact most more, more and more people are consenting towards one man one wife mm. you know but it has to be come from the individual choice so what is your choice one I man mean, one wife oh i mean i i, I think that quite personally mm that at this point i am content with one individual and, that, uh, one and that's individual. enough yes oh, wow. so the asharman girl is non-existent I, I it's a figment of the attorney general's imagination interesting so you have a you have a british wife <laughs> no i do not have a british you wife. don't okay. i've always believed um you know and this is actually a very interesting question you mm, asked mm. that i'll get there she's listening. when i was growing when i was growing mm. up right i saw people that are mine like quite um uh, like uh, Kofi Annan. Mm. And I saw that a lot of the times they had foreign wives. Yes. And I didn't understand that. Mm. You know? And I, and I think that it contributes to a certain power dynamic and reinforcing of certain narratives in, in, in young black boys when they grow up. Mm. That they do not sufficiently value the role and place of the African woman. Okay. And I don't I believe in that. I think that I've always made a pledge to myself that uh, my partner was always going to be African. And that's oh. what is most important. You okay. Know? So your partner is an African? Yes. Okay. And she doesn't live in a shy man? No, no, doesn't live in Ashaman. Okay. Even Th though we decided that we'll make Ashaman face the country headquarters. Interesting. She doesn't live in Ashaman. This is 3FM. And my name, Black Rasta, and he's Oliver. 
Mausi Baka Vomawa. So, Oliver, um, do you hold a dual citizenship? That's a very interesting question. No, mm -hmm. I do not. I only hold a Ghanaian passport. Interesting. Um, I don't think that I'm going to own any other passport. Uh, I'll continue to bring my children, uh, have my children in Ghana um, for them to hold Ghanaian only passports. Not because it secures them any advantage, but I want them to to know that they have no other alternative but to fight for this country. Oliver, you said you don't have... I do not have a dual Any other passport I do not have any passport by the Ghanaian. So passport. it means I've been deceived then? No, I do not have... I mean, anybody who's told you that will be lying to you. I do not. I only hold a Ghanaian passport and I've always traveled with only a Ghanaian passport. Why would the British be interested in you if you don't have a British passport? I mean, I, I think that... Um, Perhaps, but primarily because I was at Cambridge, um, Cambridge University, mm. and that the Cambridge authorities uh, intervened with the British authorities for them to speak up in this matter. Mm. That's why they became interested in this. Not because it's a matter that I'm a British national. No, I am not. Wow. So you have only one passport, which is the Ghana passport? Yes, I have only one passport, the Ghana passport. Wow. That is interesting. Ah. This is 3FM. Yeah. Do you want to be another Kwame Nkrumah I, I think you know <laughs> that's I, think, a very I, think, I think we saw pictures of you around Nkrumah's hometown jumping into a river almost naked and yes. trying to um, relieve yes. Nkrumah's you know things yes. yes you know for a very long time I didn't consider myself an Nkrumahist mm. in fact for, as a young person I joined the CPP for a very young person mm. and I remember that I was one of those people who used to talk about we have to be able to make the CPP friendly to people beyond Nkrumah. And I remember in one meeting, I was chased out of the meeting with chance Obika said, or the, C or the CPP, non pay Nkrumah, or your truth. I remember that it marked on me because I was a very young man. Mm. When I got into activism and mobilizing, I understood better the sacrifices and the challenges and what he went through at that time. Interesting. It gave me a cause to kind of investigate the individual and the life he lived and what he lived for. Mm. And so I became interested as a matter of fact of becoming to be able to understand and relate. Mm. And it's a journey that I think every Ghanaian must go through. You know, and so when I took on, you know, the name of Sajifo, I did it because I am I came to understand that we are all of Sajifos. Mm. And that's what the Nkrumah always intended. That all of us will understand our role and purpose in fighting for the common good. Interesting. So I think that we all must look to the person for inspiration and see ourselves all as Nkrumah. Ah. Uh. Um, fix the country. Are you planning any other demonstration yet? You know, I think that the challenge, the, the cause of standing up as citizen and mobilizing people is one that we must never shy away from and that we must be there and be present all the time. At this time, uh, we are having conversations towards demo demonstrations. Mm. Uh, yesterday, and I'm disclosing this, since the country uh, talked about announcing it, we had conversations with Martin Pebu regarding the 5th November demonstration and it seems in all likelihood that we'll be mobilizing and joining on 5th November. This is but beyond 3 that, FM. one of the things we have been, we think is important and we are mobilizing towards right. is equity mm. in the number of people who speak up and stand up. Okay. We should not make this conversation Accra based only. Mm. And for which reason face the country we are going for the nothing sector demonstrations in Tamale. Wow. So our plan is to go wow. to Tamale and hold a demonstration, one of the biggest demonstrations in Tamale, to bring the people of the north together so that they can have a voice in this republic as well. Interesting. So that's what we are planning towards. When is this going to happen? So it's going to be in November. We haven't fixed the date yet. Okay. Uh, are you looking forward to, you know, taking up a political office, Oliver? You know, as personally as an individual, I think that my calling is to be in a classroom. Mm. I love to teach. I enjoy, you know, the process of engaging young minds and towards reflecting more broadly and beyond the narrow boxes of our educational system. That's the role I kind of want to assume and be in forever. Mm. Um, but I think that it's important that I, if I'm allowing myself as a vessel to mobilize, to allow younger people to get into our politics, they should. Personally, it's not an objective for me and it's not a role I am interested in at all. All right. Okay. All right. So, have you ever worked under President Mahama in any of, you know, those political offices? No, I have never been a political appointee. Mm. In fact, I know that one of the things the the when we started face the country, the government went about and 
you know, on a fake news mission is convincing people that I was a presidential appointee. Mm. In fact, all of that is not true. I did work uh, for the Constitution Review Commission. Now, the Constitution Review Commission was established as a commission of inquiry. Now, in terms of legal structure, you right. would say that it falls under the office of the president. Mm. You know? And so, if a person was trying to be mischievous, would say I work for the office of the president. Mm. But in fact, it's not true. Uh, after I left the Constitution Review Commission, I worked as the Ministry of, with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs as a diplomat for Ghana, uh, a role I really and deeply enjoyed. Right, right. Now, when I was in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, the, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, like many other ministries, second liaison officers to, to the office of the president to be the point of contact between the ministry and, and, those, and that office. Mm. And, and one day, I, got a, I, was in, I was summoned to the office of the Director of Human Resources. Uh, Ambassador Mesri Kakari, who is now the cabinet secretary for President Nanado, mm. and who advised me that the ministry has elected that I should be that representative. You know, I, I think the Ministry of the Foreign Service would have been the youngest and most junior officer to ever hold that role. You know, and so for I, I worked as a civil servant, uh, continued to be a civil servant salary, performing liaison duties between the office of the president and the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And then after that, I subsequently resigned and left for Harvard uh, wow. from, from there. But I've never been a political appointee. And I don't, it wasn't something that was interesting. Which party do you have sympathies for? I've had strong sympathies with the CPP for a very long time. Mm. You know, uh, mm. And I think it's naturally one would understand. In fact, if you go through my social media, you would see that I've always canvassed for so many years for the CPP. Okay. Um, now I've lost a bit of faith in the CPP. Mm. Uh, I don't think that it, it has allowed itself to be used by the two dominant parties. Mm. And I'm looking forward to the days when people who really believe in the CPP, like Samia and Krumah and others, mm. would be able to take charge of the party and we can, we can reform it. Interesting. But I think now I am committed to the project of, of, of civic and individuals across party and without party coming together and safeguarding our democracy. Mm. What is um, uh, hovering between you and Adam Ochri? Any bad blood? <laughs> uh, Paul Adam Ochri is a funny man. He is. I think, oh, I think okay. he's a very funny man. Mm. Uh, I think I, I think that it's ethically wrong mm. for any presidential appointee to be moonlighting as a journalist. This is I think three it confuses, FM. I think it deceives the public and uh, represents the public trust. Mm. You know, and so I, I think as a question of moral issue, he shouldn't be should you be on national and prime time TV. Now if he chooses to be th there, he has a moral and ethical responsibility to be as objective and truthful and to hold the government to account. That is the role of the fourth estate. This gentleman has filled in all that duty. And in fact he has made it a mission of his that the very first time actually he went after me was when I was released from jail. Mm. He did a whole segment mm. uh, chastising me and, you know, going after me very hard. Uh, but before that, he had been chasing me for an interview forever oh, wow. on, on saying that my championing of a new constitution was something he also believed in. And, and I refused to attend. I refused to attend for, for many reasons. One of them being that he wanted to hold an episode saying, wanted to compare fix the currency to Jerry John Rollins. And I said, there's nothing in common. These are civilians you know, operating within a democracy and calling for change. George John Rollins uh, made a coup against the military regime. I don't see how somebody could even think that there was any parallel. And so for me, there was something fundamentally flawed from where you are beginning. Mm. And I, I, I think that when people are intellectually flawed, I don't engage with them. Well, this th is why I'm enjoying this conversation. Wow. And, 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 wow. and I have deep respect wow. for you, Black Rasta. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. In fact, Paul Adumachri says I'm his friend and that he loves me so much. <laughs> well, um, in, in one of his episodes, in fact, we have just two more minutes to go. He yeah. said that you are a s foolish boy. Now, you say he's a funny boy. Are you going to patch up anytime soon? Oh, I, I mean, I, I think that. I mean, he's, he's entitled to his words about me. Okay. I, I, for me, I have nothing personal against him as an right. individual. The most important thing is as a matter of principle and ethics, mm. he shouldn't be where he is doing mm. what he's doing. You know, that's what I just believe. I have nothing personally against him. His attacks on me have taken a very personal tone and I've refused to engage. Mm. He have taken a very ethnicist tone. In fact, he went on TV and saying that, look at his name, he's from Jelukope or somewhere like that. Mm. Things, things which, you know, were not proper to say, but I've decided not to engage. Because you know what, there are more serious characters that I have the Republic interest at heart that I want to engage with, not him. 
For real, for real. Oliver Mawusi Baka from our, you know, interviews like this are normally like seven hours non-stop. I know. Unfortunately, this is 3FM 92.7. <laughs> it is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. 3FM. Oliver is my guest. We are about to go. Now, Oliver, um, fix the country is here. Oliver is also working very hard to do some other things. He doesn't want to hold any political office. He wants to be in the classroom. If that E levy is passed, I would do that cool myself. Did you delete that post from Facebook? No, I didn't. It's still there. I mean, I, I think that we're already doing the coup. I think that the, the majority of Ghanaians rejecting the E levy and refusing and ordering their lives so that they pay the least amount of e-level. Is that public cool? Okay. I think that people speaking up against this regime, mm. is that public cool? Mm. The confidence to come up and speak up more mm. is the atmosphere we have created. That's right. And I'm grateful for it. Oliver, I want to thank you so much for coming on the show. If you have anything to say in just about 15 seconds, please feel free to. This is what I'll say. I think that the charge of waking up and standing up for our country is a charge that every citizen must have. Mm. I am encouraging everybody to come and join Martin Kwebu on November 5th mm. for the demonstration. Mm. It is important that in this moment we do not slumber or sleep. We must show that this republic means something to us mm. so that people who have captured the state will be reminded that the country belongs to us mm. and not to them. Thank you. Oliver, thank you so much. <laughs> Well, my name is Black Cross, and I want to say thank you so much for coming along, Oliver. Mawusi Baka from From Jolly Copper. Has been my guest in 